I want to take a moment and uh, welcome our online visitors. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I think there are a lot of places you could have been. I am Pastor Herman Scales from Cedar Faith International. Uh, we are located in Raytown, Missouri. That's just outside of Kansas City. Uh, if you have any in the Kansas City, please, Kansas City area, please come and visit us. We're located at 9301 East 87th Street. If you have a comment or a question, then please type it in the, the comment bar. Uh, would you share this so somebody else could get this message? Would you turn on uh, notifications so you'll know whenever we're online? God bless you and, and, I, and may this word be a blessing to your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, would you open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 20, go to verse 19. You go right there, and I'm, and, and, and I'm going to catch up with you. Now, this is Resurrection Sunday. I have a question for you on this Resurrection Sunday. Have you ever decided on something that you would never do again? Have you ever just made a decision, I'm never, never going to do that again? See, when, when, I, when I met Dr. Myra, I had decided I am never, ever getting married again. I have been married. And it didn't work out good for me. So I had decided that I do not need a wife. What I need a wife for, I can cook myself. Cook Christmas dinner, cook, cook Easter dinner. I can cook myself. I can clean my own house. Have a good clean house. Wash my own clothes. Raising my own child. So I, I didn't need a wife. Uh, had all of the female companions I could deal with. So I had decided that I don't need a wife. I had good, valid reasons. They were all good and valid for me why I didn't need a wife. But then I met Dr. Myers. Now, when I met Dr. Myra, none of my valid reasons changed. I could still cook. I could still wash and iron my own clothes. I could still dress myself, maybe not quite that well. But I could still dress myself. As a matter of fact, I, I met Dr. Myra at uh, a night college course. And uh, to kind of tell you how I dress myself, so we, it was a 13-week course, night school, management course. And so my idea was I had a shirt that I wore to school. It was my school shirt. So every week, I put on my school shirt to wear to school. So when we started dating, she said, where is that shirt that you wear to class? I said, that's right there. That's my school church shirt. She said, well, why don't you wear a different shirt? I said, because that's my school shirt. Why would I need to wear a different shirt to school when I got a school shirt? So I knew how to dress myself, though maybe not quite that well. But then... I met Dr. Myra, and there was something special about her. There was obviously something different that I hadn't seen before. Then I began to have this personal experience with her that negated all of my justifiable reasons to why I didn't want to get married again. Counseled all of them, though they were the same. 
I could still cook. I could still iron. I, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, we, uh, I, I didn't actually have permission for this, but I hope I don't get in trouble. Uh, we, we, we was on vacation one time, and uh, we was with another couple, and so I had came downstairs where, uh, in, a, in a condo in their, in their apartment, and so I asked where was the iron. So the lady said, well, you mean to tell me, Dr. Meyer, making you iron your clothes? I said, well, I already ironed mine. This is hers. <laughs> So I can still iron. But because of this personal experience with her, it canceled all of that. And we've been married for 37 years. She had decided early on in her young adulthood that she'd never be married to a preacher. No way. She's seen preachers. She's been around preachers. And she said, under no circumstances do I want to marry to a preacher and certainly not a pastor. But she's been married for, to one, uh, for a preacher for at least 35 years and happy. So there's something about a personal experience that will counsel all of your justified reasons for making a decision that you weren't going to do something ever again. Are you with me? So, see, when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and this giving your life to Christ and this attending the church, many of us, many people have good justified reasons why they don't need to be part of this. They made them up. I don't ever need to go to no church again. I've been to a church. I've seen things in church. All them church people just fake anyway. They up there praising on Sunday, drinking on Monday. Them church people, they too judgmental. I need to be around them. I went in there and they looked at me funny, acted funny. Somebody got mad at me because I sit in their seat. I don't ever need to go to church again. Matter of fact, that Christianity is just a crutch for the weak. I don't need that. God is not really real anyway. You might have a whole bunch of valid reasons why you, don't, why you don't want to be part of the kingdom of God. But a personal experience with Jesus Christ will cancel all of those reasons. L let me show you what I mean. You, you and John, right? You in John chapter 20. Now this is after the resurrection. John chapter 20, verse 19. I'm reading out of the New Living Translations, but you should be able to stay along with me. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy because they had seen the Lord. So now the disciples saw Jesus after the resurrection. Saw the, the, the nails in his hand. Saw the hole in his side. And they had this experience with Jesus Christ and, and they were joyful because they had seen the Lord. But then we know that Thomas, who we sometimes call Doubting Thomas, he wasn't with them when they saw the Lord. So they've had an experience, but Thomas didn't have that experience. So in verse 25 it says this, they told him, him being Thomas, 
we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I don't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hands into the wounds in his side. Now we call him Doubting Thomas, but really, a lot of us doubting people. If you've been around church folk, you have to, you know, be skeptical. I mean, church folk will make you skeptical. So I, I, I can imagine Thomas. Thomas come back from, from whatever he was doing. They're talking about, we have seen the Lord. Yeah, sure. That's your testimony. Now see, a testimony from somebody else might be good. A testimony from somebody else might have good words in it. But a testimony from somebody else don't necessarily change you. Because that's their testimony. That's what they say happened to them. You don't know if it's true or not. But you hear it and go, okay, that might be true. But Thomas was like, I don't believe a word you're saying. Unless I see him myself. Unless I touch his hand. See his size. I'm not going to believe that. Because Thomas says that I can't trust your experience. And see, I mean, again, Jesus said, you know, it, 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 Jesus says later, blessed are those who believe and have not seen, but I don't know, man. I've been pastor for a long time. And sometimes I have trouble trusting, man, these Christians' experiences, man. Because God told him one thing one day, told him something else the next day. They love God on Sunday, cussing on Monday. Preaching in the pulpit, got a girlfriend on the side. Stealing money. I mean, so I can understand why Thomas would say like, yeah, that's what you say. But I ain't going to believe it unless I see it myself. Then in verse 27, it says, eight days later. Now, you know, we, we often overlook that, eight days later. So think about this. They saw Jesus, told Jesus, we saw the Lord. Jesus said, I don't believe that. Tom, I mean, Thomas said, I don't believe that. So day number one passed, Thomas said, word of the Lord. I know y'all, I knew y'all was just fibbing. They go, no, no, we've seen him. Well, where is he? We don't know. Sure. Day two. I don't see him. What you said didn't happen. Nothing had changed. My reasons is valid. Day three, no Jesus. Day four, no Jesus. Day five, yeah, I know I can't believe them Christians. They probably was just drinking. Maybe they, 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 they probably were just smoking. Can't believe nothing they say. It's been five days. They probably forgot what they said they said. Day six, all of my reasons, all of my valid reasons for not believing that you have seen the Lord are valid and it's six days later. Seven, day seven. It's a week later. And you want me to believe something that God told you and I haven't seen any manifestation of what you said, I ain't going to believe it. I can't trust your testimony. Day seven, day eight now come. And the Bible say, eight days later, the disciples were, were again 
And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked suddenly, as before, Jesus standing among them, a stunning money. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hand. Put your hand into the womb in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, but believe. Then Thomas said, my God, my Lord, or my Lord, my God, Thomas explained. Now see, everything that happened on day one was still true. Everything that happened on day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, all of that was still true. But on day eight, he had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. That personal experience counseled all of his reasons for not trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, his life was changed forever. And if you look in, 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 in uh, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 9, uh, Jesus heals a blind man. And what he really does is he, he t the blind man calls him. He, Jesus tells the blind man, he prays over him. He said, can you see? He says, I see men like trees. Jesus spit on the ground, put some mud on him. And then Jesus tells him to go wash his, his uh, face in, in, in the river. He go watch his face, and then he come back and he can see. But now everybody didn't believe that. Some people said that, well, he did this on the Sabbath, because it was the Sabbath day, and he had to be a demon to do this on the Sabbath. But this blind man had had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. Jesus had touched him. He didn't know all the answers, see. So you might have a personal experience with Jesus Christ. It might not answer all your questions. You might not know about the five horses of the apocalypse. You might not know about predestination and undestination. You might not completely understand sanctification. You might not understand, but you know you had an experience with Jesus Christ. And it changed you. So the Pharisees bring this guy to him and they say, well, we need you to explain to us what happened. So in John 9, 30, 24, it says this. So again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. So they said, listen. Don't give that man the glory. Give God the glory, because this man got to be a sinner. So here's what the blind man says. He answered and said to them, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see. See, I, I can't explain everything to you about God. I can't explain why he do all the things that he do. I can't really tell you why bad things sometimes happen to good people. I really don't understand everything. But what I know is that I was lost and now I'm saved. I was sad and now I'm happy. I know my life has changed because I've had an experience with him. A personal experience with him. The Apostle Paul had an experience with Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 3, it says Saul was going everywhere, everywhere to devastate the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them in the jail. So Saul had valid reasons why he needed to get rid of 
these Christian believers, or these Christ believers. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. These Christ folks was causing trouble. And he had good, valid reasons why he needed to get rid of them. He hated them. He was there when, uh, dang, just lost it. Uh, Stephen was stoned to death. He saw it and celebrated it. He celebrated it so much that he got a letter saying, let me go everywhere I can and find these Christ believers and bring them back and throw them in the jail. Are you with me? So Acts, Acts chapter 9 verse 1 says this. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath. He was eager to destroy the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters, a letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking their cooperation in the rest of any followers of the way. He found there. He wanted to bring them both men and women back to Jerusalem in jail. He had a good valid reason that I need to bring these Christ followers back and put them in jail. Are you, are, are you there? So he's on his way to Damascus. Here's what happened in verse 3. As he, as he was near in Damascus on his mission, a bright light from heaven suddenly beamed down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. See, now Saul has had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. He probably had a lot of questions about what's this mean, and, and, and what should I do? And he probably had a lot of questions, but he knew he had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. It became personal to him. On that day, Saul died and Paul was born, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. See, I don't, I don't know about you. I don't know about your experience. I don't even know really why some of you are even here today. You got a full house. I don't know why you're here. You might have just came because the children was going to be dancing and you wanted to see the dance. Maybe you came because y'all because y'all going to have dinner across the street and, and well, we're going to have dinner. We might as well go early and, and, and participate in the dinner, the service. Maybe you just, you just came here because, well, it's Easter and everybody go to church on Easter and Christmas. So come on, family, we're going to get all dressed up and we can go to church because it's Easter. And that's what you do. Or maybe you might be going through some difficult situation in your life, some challenge. And you say, let me go to church. Or maybe you just need some new direction in your life. I don't know why you're here. It's personal. You came here for a personal reason. But what's important is that Jesus wants to have a personal experience with you. Jesus wants to touch you. You can hear other people's testimony. You can hear other people's stories. You might know all, might not know all, all your questions might not be answered. But Jesus wants to have a personal experience with you. And he is so good 
that you can initiate that experience. Because James 4, 8 says, draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto you. So all you got to do is make a reach out to him. All you got to do is say, I want to get close to you. And even while he's taking care of quasars and black holes and stars and the whole universe, he stopped. He said, well, hold, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I need to go talk to my brother, to my sister. He want to have a personal experience with you. Your personal experience will change your life. I don't care who teaches what. I don't care what your mama said, what your, do, what your daddy said. He needs to touch you personally. But he's faithful and just. If you just make a reach out to him, he'll reach out to you. And I'm telling you, he'll change your life. He'll take you from the prison to the White House. He'll take the, he'll turn your enemies into your footstool. He'll rewrite your resume so the people that get to know you can't believe who you were. But it won't happen with you just sitting back. You got to decide the resurrection was for me. Jesus is for me. I want him to touch my life. If I just reach out and say, I want him to touch my life, he is faithful. He will come and touch your life. Amen. Amen. So for you online, if you never made a decision for Jesus Christ, just make a decision for him. If you just, you don't, you don't have to understand everything. You don't know all the answers to the questions. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Guide me. I believe that you rose this day just for me. He will send his spirit into your spirit crying out, Abba, Father, and you will become a child of God. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Pastor Sims to come and, and, and make, make, make our appeal to those in the sanctuary and those online. Mm -hmm.